Wim Raymaker, the global head of mar banking markets at SWIFT, um, talking to us today about SWIFT's roadmap in the Raminbi business. Thank you very much for speaking to us today, uh, Wim. Um, can you give us a sense of uh, the Raminbi agenda with SWIFT, given the fact that today there is a offshore renminbi market, uh, which is the CNH, and the onshore renminbi market, which is the CNY, and um, the, the whole ambition of the Chinese government to make the renminbi one of uh, the global currencies, and maybe even uh, reserve currency going forward. Um, what are some of the operational um, agendas do you think that we should be concerned about when it comes to the renminbi? Uh, I think there are two dimensions to that. And uh, we're looking at the uh, further internationalization of the RMB, possibly beyond Hong Kong uh, at this stage, to see what is the impact on banks' operations on a global level. Uh, that can be both how does it create new opportunities for banks to provide RMB services to their corporate customers, on one hand, and secondly, to see what does it take for a bank to be ready to provide RMB services to their customers. Now, where the world is at the moment is that Hong Kong is essentially the only clearing center for uh, RMB outside of China. Uh, Singapore has, uh, is setting up an infrastructure, and in all likelihood, the, the uh, clearing bank will be a Chinese bank. Uh, London has expressed an interest in, in being a RMB clearing uh, center. Um, uh, all of these um, centers that are uh, interested in clearing RMB, what are some of the infrastructure that they need to have in place before they're ready? I think from an infrastructure point of view, you have to look at the underlying business that banks are doing their business in. Is it straight settlement? Is it FX operations? Is it bond issuance? Is it um, purely currency exchange, forward rate swaps agreements? So I think you have to look at, from a bank operational point of view, to your question, to be ready, as to what is the product that you're providing to your customer. Is it a real deal customer who is maybe looking at remittances? Or is it a corporate customer who wants to hedge against the FX risk and therefore is interested in FX swaps and uh, forward uh, rate agreements? Uh, or is it uh, to provide trade settlements on the back of an international import-export agreement? Right. So th those are the, on the product front what the, what the participating institution should be interested in. Um, I guess the first question really is, um, what should SWIFT be seen as supporting? CNH or CNY? I, I guess that's not a question for SWIFT to answer as such. Uh, I think that's more a question for the Chinese uh, regulator and government. Uh, there was a, a question whether there should be a new currency. Uh, and it went to ISO and uh, from a SWIFT point of view, we can support an additional currency. Uh, but I don't think that's the question. I think the question is, is there a desire for a second currency? Well, when you deal with a desire, there are several desires in the marketplace. There are some. Um, players outside of China who see the, the, uh, the need for a second currency uh, uh, something desirable because uh, it helps them to add their product base and, and, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and there are some who think that at the end of the day the CNH is really a, a derivative of the CNY and therefore uh, SWIFT should really be supporting the CNY. I think for the moment we'll play it by the regulator's opinion in terms of creating a new currency or not. As far as SWIFT is concerned, we can carry the currency code in our messages. Uh, meantime, there are working groups being set up to look at how we can accommodate for the uh, instruction of the CNH when it relates to a CNH transaction. Right, so what is the regulator's opinion? Well, I think the question you should ask to the regulator. Right, but what is uh, coming out from the conversations that you As heard? far as I understood it, there is no immediate desire to actually create a second currency. Right, but the onshore currency is uh, limited. Um, it's not, um, uh, the capital account is not open, uh, and um, a lot of the transaction, in fact, all of the business is domestic, essentially. Um, so that would essentially mean that uh, SWIFT has to have 
uh, access to the domestic market in China, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say that that would be true? I think that is true, and I think you should take a longer term perspective on this. Uh, and I think in the longer run, I think the market will move to the onshore market, as it were. Uh, I don't see um, a multitude of currencies, a CNH, a CNS, a CNG, if it goes to uh, Great Britain. I, I just don't see a multitude of, of currencies, uh, whether uh, depending on the location where they are traded. So I think it is maybe a more short-term um, market uh, practice, whereas I think in the long term it will probably be a single currency. That's my that's my personal. Opinion. Yeah, but at the same time, if the CNH becomes successful, uh, well traded, creates a secondary market, becomes very liquid, it will have a very different yield curve. It will it will operate to very different circumstances around the world. Um, than the CNY. So technically, some people would argue is that the CNH is, is uh, technically a different currency as a result. And uh, it may require um, a, you know, a kind of a avatar type um, support from SWIFT. Which, which is indeed why we have created three working groups to figure out how they should actually use the CNH and develop some market practice around using that in the meantime. And what would that end up with for SWIFT as the infrastructure provider? I think very practically. So we can carry the CNH currency code and the market practice around that will let the market players use the CNH in the offshore market when they need to. Well, so in, in other words, you're keeping your options open, but at some point you will have to make a decision as to um, which of the you know the the variations that you you would want to support, and I think it can e go either way. I so think in, in terms of supporting a currency, that's fine. Um, but we I think there we should follow the policy rule. It has gone to ISO. It's gone, I think, to the uh, Chinese authorities. Uh, I think for the time being, I don't see if I could say an enthusiasm uh, to create such a second currency code. Personally, I subscribe to that as well. I, I don't see uh, the need for a second currency code as such. But at the meantime, to your point, there is a different yield curve, a different interest rate possibly uh, on CNY being traded offshore. So at the same time, we need to accommodate that. Well, and, and therefore, uh, I think these working groups can define best practice on how to accommodate uh, the trading when it involves, when it involves uh, C and H related transactions. Well, the quest the answers that you've given so far um, just calls into question SWIFT's own access to the domestic marketplace in China. The the large banks are definitely enthusiastic supporters of SWIFT outside of China, um, and there is a lot of opportunities that potentially should be open to SWIFT um, to the domestic institutions in China, but that's closed at the moment. But how do you how would you describe your access to the Chinese domestic market? Well, I. Agree. That's probably an area where we can develop even further. Uh, the meantime, I think coming back to your initial point on the RMB internationalization, one interesting uh, statistic is that we see a very strong increase in Chinese banks uh, and banks in China uh, opening up accounts for banks who want to do increased business with China. So we see a 22% increase in terms of account openings and cash statements out of China. So I think the more international the RMB gets, you, the more transactions will come into China, and therefore I think there will be an increased usage of SWIFT possibly within China. So I think that's probably a good way to build it up.